Hello and welcome to We On Live broadcast from London. I'm Oliver Regan and these are the headlines. North Korea fires around 130 artillery shells into the sea off its east and west coasts, claims South Korea's military. This in the latest apparent military drill near their shared border. West African leaders agree to create a regional force to intervene against terrorism and in the event of coups. The status of Iran's morality police's closure remains unclear. State media says Interior Ministry hasn't confirmed the closure. This after their chief prosecutor said the force had been abolished. Isaac Herzog in Bahrain for the first trip by an Israeli head of state to the Gulf Kingdom. Regional security and business ties discussed in his meeting with the king. India's capital is engulfed in thick smog. As cooler weather exacerbates pollution, the government bans private construction in and around the city to try and limit dust and emissions. UK House of Lords member Michelle Morn has been accused of bullying ministers. In order to get the public PPE contracts worth over $245 million to a company. In April, UK's National Crime Agency launched a potential fraud investigation into the PPE company linked to Michelle Morn. It also searched the Tory Pierce home. A Lords Standards Committee also held an inquiry into the allegations. Earlier, UK publisher The Guardian revealed that the Conservative peer and her children secretly received over $32 million from the profits of a PPE business. The company was awarded large government contracts after she recommended it to ministers. In the latest, some reports claim that Mon has lobbied Housing Secretary Michael Gove and Lord Agnew at the start of the pandemic in 2020 in order to secure business for PPE According to the report, Mon wrote to Gove and Agnew on their personal email addresses, claiming that she'd managed to source PPE masks through her team in Hong Kong and requested for a reply as soon as possible. And when she felt the government was taking too long to respond, reports claim that Mon pressed Agnew via email and telephone to, quote, accelerate the process. According to a source, Mon was rude, abrasive and was bullying. Some bank records were seen by The Guardian Seen by The Guardian revealed that the secret offshore trust, which had Mon and her children as its beneficiaries, received more than $35 million, originated from the profits of PPE MedPro. PPE MedPro supplied face masks and medical gowns during the pandemic. UK PM Rishi Sunak also faced calls from the main opposition parties to withdraw the Tory whip from the House of Lords, as Mon's corruption allegation grows. It also raises questions about the amount of power given to the members of the House of Lords. Meanwhile, the opposition Labour Party is looking forward to abolishing the House of Lords and replacing it with a new reformed upper chamber. Labour chief Keir Starmer wants to limit the powers given to politicians to appoint people to the chamber in the first term of a Labour government. The party is expected to confirm its plans in its next manifesto. For more... Hello, Alex. Many thanks for joining us. Can you give us your sense of how much this issue is, is causing a consternation in the Conservative Party at the moment? It's a massive issue and it's not just uh, Michelle Mon. It, there are other contractors throughout the COVID crisis that were given this VIP status. It means that they could get fast tracked to, uh, to get these procurements of masks, of COVID tests, 
of all sorts um, and they were getting money whereas usually the government should be asking for tenders from all a range of people and then they would choose the best options but this VIP fast track which um, a lot of supposedly a lot of their friends and colleagues has got has caused a lot of consternation within the party within the public as well because millions and millions of pounds has been spent and not all of it has gone to anywhere specific talking about 200 million that was spent on PPE Medro well a lot of those gowns that were supposedly brought in from China were never able to be used because they didn't actually hit the health and safety regulations that we require in the UK and there has been a lot of conversation about what, other, what else has the money gone and where can we follow this money because I think when we had the furlough schemes with obviously COVID the UK taxpayer was having to pay out a lot and then they're finding out that all of this money has gone somewhere where we've not actually had anything provisionally brought back to us so the Conservatives were already in hot water during the whole uh, Boris Trust and Sunak PM crisis and they seem to be getting themselves into further distress and you know I'm not surprised if a poll comes out this week to show that the Conservatives are not doing well with the general public. Of course and this brings um, another contrast between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party in terms of the future of the House of Lords as well. Give us the latest on that issue. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Keir Starmer has said uh, before now that he did think that the House of Lords should be abolished and a new chamber put in place, one that isn't just given to uh, friends and colleagues uh, of those who are in Parliament and it should be a stricter regime. But there does need to be something in its place because the House of Lords does also take part in the way that the bills are formed. So we don't exactly know what Keir Starmer is putting into this potential uh, proposition that he wants to move forward. Of course, he also has to make sure that his party Party do get into power and then they've only got four years to push something through but it does seem that from a lot of a lot of the public that they do think that the House of Lords is a bit old-fashioned and it's no longer of use and especially when we're hearing about people who are lobbying to get places there and then they get these peers and then they also are, are, are getting funds so there is that it, it does seem to be that it's a bit of an abstract concept that does need to be really reformed and quickly as well as the country is concerned about the cost of living crisis and they're looking to see where all of the money is going from the government. A series of highly disruptive UK rail strikes looks inevitable as the UK's largest rail trade union rejects an improved pay offer by the employers. The rail delivery group offered the union a pay rise of 8% over two years with a guarantee of no compulsory redundancies till April 2024. The offer was aimed at resolving a long-running dispute over jobs, pay and conditions. Thousands of RMT members across 14 train operators and Network Rail in UK are due to stage two 48-hour strikes this month. The industrial action is currently due to take place on the 13th, 14th and 16th, 17th of December and the 3rd, 4th and 6th, 7th of January. According to Rail Delivery Group, the offer they made also included a pay rise for staff of 4% this year and it also proposed that the process of buying tickets at stations would be modernised. The government of Rishi Sunak has maintained the stance of his predecessors saying ministers should not be directly involved in pay negotiations. And as the UK is witnessing in industry action across the sectors, Conservative Party Chairman Nadim Zahawi says the government has set up contingency plans to minimise possible strike disruptions this month. And this includes drafting the military to fill border and NHS duties. So we're looking at the military, we're looking at a specialist response force, which we've actually uh, set up uh, a number of years ago, uh, the surge capacity to be able to deal uh, with uh, in the unfortunate circumstance, if you do have, say, a, a striker border force, uh, you've got to be able to uh, make sure that there is minimum disruption. The most important thing is to secure. In October, UK inflation accelerated to a 41 year peak at 11.1%. And the food and energy prices are still soaring amid a cost of living crisis. This weekend brought a fresh round of Russian attacks near the front line in both southern and eastern Ukraine. According to Ukrainian officials, Russia is getting ready for a massive attack on Ukraine's critical infrastructure. According to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, his forces are holding positions along the front line, as Bakhmut is being viewed as Russia's next target in their advance through Donetsk. 
According to Russia's Defence Ministry, its troops are conducting successful operations in the area of Bakhmut and have also pushed back Ukrainian attacks towards Donetsk. The head of US intelligence says fighting in Ukraine militaries on both sides are looking to refit and resupply in order to prepare for a counter-offensive after the harsh winter. UK Defence Ministry predicts Russia is likely planning to encircle the town of Bakhmut with tactical advances to the north and south. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has said that the Ukrainians will have to do everything to get through the winter, especially after Russia targeted Ukraine's infrastructure last month. Meanwhile, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has said it would be a grave mistake to completely, to uh, completely stop talking to the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Scholz made his remarks after he and Putin held a phone conversation to discuss Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine. I have spoken to Putin repeatedly since then because I am firmly convinced that it is a grave mistake. If despite all the differences, and this is, after all, a small word for huge difference, we no longer talk to each other at all. That is why it is also important that the French president and I, as representatives of the G7 countries, as two NATO countries, keep seeking dialogue again. Meanwhile, a group of seven G7 price caps on, on Russian seaborne oil comes into force as the West tries to limit Moscow's ability to finance its war in Ukraine. However, Russia says it will not abide by the measure, even if it has to cut production. The G7 nations and Australia agreed a $60 per barrel price cap on Russian seaborne crude oil. This comes after European Union members overcame a resistance from Poland. Covid lockdowns have hit China's economy hard, choking domestic consumption, disrupting supply chains and even stoking rare street protests across many cities. The latest data shows China's services activity shrank to six-month lows in November. This as widening Covid containment measures weighed on demand. Marking the third monthly contraction in a row, the Global Services Purchasing Managers Index fell to 46.7 from 48.4. Chinese companies have reported the strongest falls in output and new work for six months and continue to cut staff. Confidence in the outlook for the next 12 months has also fallen to an eight-month low level. The rate of job losses was the quickest seen since the survey began in November 2005, pointing to further strains on the labour market. The 50-point index mark separates growth from contraction on a monthly basis. However, one bright spot was that export business returned to growth from contraction in October. This was partly due to the relaxation of international travel rules. Companies also continued to raise their prices whilst input cost inflation softened. As new COVID-19 infections hit record highs in November and more lockdowns were imposed, China's economy took a hit. The impact was high as areas in lockdowns accounted for about a quarter of China's GDP. Thousands of truckers in South Korea are demonstrating for the minimum wage protections. Around 25,000 truckers in the country are calling on the government for a permanent minimum pay system, known as the safe freight rate. The truckers, who have been demonstrating for weeks, now say that we are not the enemy and are loyal to South Korea, further asserting on how they have been contributing to the country's exports. They say that they are aware of the impact of the strike on the South Korean economy, but emphasised on how their call for stronger minimum pay protection stands between them and poverty. I <laughs> 전부 다이 자리 지켜서 끝까지 끝까지 투쟁을 해서 이어 나갈 겁니다. 44년을 이, 이거를 했는데 이 화물차를 했는데 그 전에는 안전 문제가 안 돼서 힘들었지만 그래도 1년 전에는 그래도 한시적으로나마 안전 문제가 돼서 조금 났어요. 근데 요즘 그 우크라이나 전쟁이 터지고 물가가 뭐 기름값이 1,200원, 1,100원에서 1,800원, 자, 2,000, 2,200원까지 올라갔어요. 
and amid a prolonged truckers' strike, the South Korean president, Yoon Suk-yeol, has ordered preparations for widening a back-to-work order beyond the cement industry. Yoon had earlier invoked a start-to-work order, asking 2,500 drivers in the cement industry to return back to work. Reports say he's now planning to issue a similar order on other sections, such as oil refining and steel making. Yoon Suk-yeol earlier said that his administration would not give in to what it calls the unjustified demands by the truckers' union. This is the second major strike in the country in the last six months, and it's disrupted the supplies of cars and fuel in the country. The South Korean government and the union have sat down for talks twice, but remain far apart on two key issues, that is, extending the minimum pay rules beyond the end of this year and expanding them to benefit more truckers. The government has specifically said that it will not extend the minimum pay protection to truckers in the fuel and steel industries, asserting on how it is already well paid. England's recently acquired, uh, acquired reputation, should I say, as tournament football experts has been reaffirmed. After sealing a second consecutive World Cup quarter-final berth, the three Lions beat African champions Senegal to set up a mouth-watering clash with defending champions France. Just one change for England as Bakaya Saka came in for Marcus Rashford. And England saw much of the ball in the opening quarter, but the Lions of Taranga denied them space to inflict any real damage. Senegal then took the game to England and with a better team. That was until Liverpool captain Jordan Henderson scored against the run of play in the 38th minute after a precise cutback from the star man of the night, Jude Bellingham. Bellingham then set up Phil Foden in first half stoppage time, who played in captain Harry Kane for his first goal of the tournament later on. The 1966 world champions then put the game to bed in the 58th minute and after another swift attack, Ford and laying it on perfectly for Saka to get on the score sheet. The game meandered to its obvious conclusion after that, with England now set to meet France for the first time in five years on Saturday. As a striker, um, scoring goals is, is what you do and it's one of the best feelings you can have in football. So, uh, of course, I was um, yeah, waiting patiently to, to try and score and uh, thankfully that was today and um, yeah, you know, I feel good. Hopefully this can start a good run for, for me personally because I know that will help the team as well. But as you saw today, we're, we've got people scoring from all different positions, which is, uh, I think, really important when you go uh, into the later stages of a tournament. So Kanye West's social media game is far from being over after getting suspended from Twitter Years back on Instagram to take a dig at none other than Twitter CEO Elon Musk. Once good friends, Musk and West are now turning into frenemies. Days after Elon Musk banned Kanye West from Twitter after violating rules, Kanye took a dig at the Twitter boss. The rapper asked his 18.4 million followers on Instagram if they also think that Musk could be half Chinese. He wrote, and we quote, Am I the only one who thinks Elon could be half Chinese? Have you ever seen his pick as a child? Take a Chinese genius and mate them with a South African supermodel and we have Elon, unquote. Well, many considered it as a dig against the world's richest man. The SpaceX chief responded to West's remark and called it a compliment. Last week, Yi's Twitter account was suspended after he tweeted an image of the Nazi swastika intertwined with the Star of David as a campaign logo. His account was one of several high-profile Twitter accounts that were reinstated after billionaire Musk took over the platform in October. Looks like we can now call it the end of the bromance between Elon Musk and Kanye West. We all know about Santa Claus's famous flying sleigh, but have you ever seen Santa ditch his ride? Take a look at our next report to see not one, but a thousand sprinting Santas take over a small German town. <laughs>
Well, that's the end of today's live broadcast. This is We On, live from London. I'm Oliver Regan. Uh, is this a break, uh, Arab?